Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. The United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, UNRWA, represented by 47 nations, convenes to solve the food famine which threatens more than half a billion people left destitute by war. Meeting in San Francisco in the summer of 1945, it's draft the charter for a permanent international agency, an organization of United Nations to police and preserve world peace. They seek asylum from conflicts in Burundi, Rwanda, Kenya, Congo, Sudan, Somalia, Ethiopia, and Eritrea. The Zatari refugee camp has become the second biggest in the world. Home to over 100,000 people, it's now one of the most densely populated parts of the country. People are eager to take a chance on peace. This is part of over $500 million the United States is providing in humanitarian aid to Afghanistan this year. UN officials cited the wars in Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, and South Sudan as one of the major reasons there are nearly 60 million people forcibly displaced worldwide. Dadaab in Kenya, near Somalia's border, is the world's largest refugee camp. 25 years ago, Somalia's civil war broke out, and the United Nations built this camp to house 90,000 refugees. Hello? Assalamu alaikum. How are you, brother? How are you doing? How's this study? My last year, I'm taking things one thing at a time. My main goal is to be like a social worker. Mm -hmm. I like to help out people, and that's what a social work is all about. How's mom? How's she doing? Oh, she's doing good. She's um, here with me. I wish I could be with you and mom and sister and Abdagani and Halim. Just bust my greeting to all. Thank you, brother. I will call you a weekend or the weekend next week, inshallah. Uh, I love you too, Alay. Okay, I love you too. So you are told in the essay, we will be writing uh, the question you are told. Then you are going to discuss what is being a refugee? What is the importance of being a refugee? Refugee. Refugee is a person who, who is living in another place whereby it's not their homeland. Refugee is being out of your country because of war. Refugee is the heart of, of the people who ran from their home. I was born in Ethiopia in 1995. We have been killed in our homeland. I will be a refugee because my, there's no peace in my country. It is already the world's largest refugee camp, but Dadaab in northern Kenya is full. It just can't cope with the hundreds of Somalis heading across the border. Originally built for just 90,000 people, it's currently home to more than 350,000. These people have walked days to get here. Exhausted and hungry, they must wait to be registered. It's emotional. My mother could not be able to talk to me at times. She feels, you know, like crying. At times I cut the phone. I just cry and feel emotional. I, can't, I cannot be able to join them you know, in the festivity and have fun. Good morning. Uh, thank you for hosting me this morning. And uh, this is school, Halana Primary School, is the school that I started schooling like you until I reached uh, my college. And uh, thank you for hosting me today. This morning, I want to discuss with you mainly about my family and also the passion and the attention I always give to education and the voice that I know as a community that you have. My name is Liban Rashid Mohammed. I am Somali by nationality, currently living in the Dab, refugee camp in Kenya as a refugee, and I came here to seek for refuge. We fled from Somalia in 1991 when I was a kid, four years, with my mother, brother, and sister, and also my dad. We left there because of civil war. We fled on foot, and it took us 25 days to reach to the Kenya-Somalia border and brought to Ifo refugee camp, the DAP, in 1991. 
Dadaab is the world's largest refugee camp. Uh, there's refugee camps all over the world. Uh, just within Kenya, there's another 50,000 refugees in uh, urban refugees based in Nairobi. And there's the Kakuma refugee camp, uh, which has uh, more than 100,000 there. Uh, you also have refugee camps with, uh, with Somali refugees all through the region, including just across the Ethiopian border. If you go even further worldwide, then obviously you have refugee situations that have been going for as long as the Somali situation has uh, in places like Burma, Afghanistan, all over the world. If you come from a country that is in war or civil war, those conditions still exist in your country. It means that you cannot go back to your country because the conditions that made you leave your country are still prevailing. We cannot say that this is the cup that you can live as a refugee for two years, three years. The Dab opened in 1991 with 90,000 people originally who fled from the civil war in Somalia that followed the collapse of the government there. Uh, those people were settled into three towns. Each town had around 30,000 people um, around this original border settlement of Dadaab. So Dadaab is actually the name of the Kenyan border town. And then these three refugee camps were 10 times the size of that town, and they all had their own names. Dadaab is actually a city with five different suburbs, each suburb between 50 and 100,000 people. The official size of the camp in terms of the registered refugees is around 350,000 people, which is about the same size as metropolitan New Orleans or Zurich in Europe. But unofficially, the camp is probably much bigger than that. Um, I, my estimate is that it's around 500 to 600,000 people. So you can just imagine all the problems you would find crowded together in uh, very small areas and you hope and pray that it will be temporary initially. With the situation continuing, the conflict continuing back home, they become long-standing. Refugee camps are not suitable for uh, the provision of uh, good quality uh, protection because yeah, they are overcrowded. They are artificial creations. But what we would prefer is that refugees enjoy freedom of movement, just like you and me. I think it's really worth keeping in mind that the, uh, the world's biggest hosts to refugees are developing countries themselves. Countries like Kenya, but also Pakistan, Iran. Syria was one of the world's biggest hosts to refugees. And now, of course, Syria is itself uh, part of an ongoing refugee crisis. And we have uh, more than a million or two million refugees leaving Syria over the last year or so always falls on the countries that are adjacent to the countries where the crisis are, and they tend to be countries that actually need assistance themselves. One thing which I think is common to refugees in Dadaab is the feeling of being somewhat trapped where they are, almost like a purgatory. They can't go home, but they also can't leave. According to the Kenyan policy, encampment is one of the main problem that refugees complain about. And the Kenyan law states that a refugee should stay in a refugee camp. Here, for the context of that app, you don't have to move from the 50 kilometers radius. You'll find some of the youth who have been born or who arrived here young, who have grown here, who are married now here with children. They have not gone out of this that app camps for the last 20 years. About 45% of refugees have been living in a protracted refugee situation for five years or more. That's about six and a half million refugees. The average duration of that is actually much longer than five years. It's, it's closer to 25. You now have second, third, even fourth generation refugees who are effectively born into this type of, you know, extremely restricted life and may have children themselves who are now being born into that once again. So that's what it means to be warehoused, is living in a place for 25 years with no options really for building a, a proper life. Most of the people that live here are of uh, different communities that some come from East Africa, Central Africa and the Great Lakes region. As you can see here, the houses are now very close to each other. 
if a family come from uh, Somalia in 1991 and consists of uh, five people by now, maybe they might be 10 or some might marry and, you know, have uh, new children and so it always increases and that's what causes now uh, these roads to be, you know, narrow. Here you can see people always fence themselves with uh, uh, these uh, thorny so that they protect themselves at night with the uh, bandits and also anything that can cause insecurity. This way I stay, these are my neighbors, very close neighbors of mine. Uh, this also another friend of mine that stays in this house. But this is where I stay with another friend. This is my room and uh, the room is made up of uh, uh, tree branches and uh, the mud, which is uh, made with clay oil. I put this cloth so that uh, the place becomes a bit cooler and then set up uh, putting this thing so that it looks, uh, you know, very beauty and welcoming. Life in the dab is very difficult and, uh, you know, it is harsh. I come to realize that uh, it is very important to share these problems that's happening in this camp to the rest of the world. And I come up with the idea of uh, directing a film called Welcome to the Dab uh, to bring up the voice of the community and, and the world to be able to understand their life change from being Somali as their own country and coming to Kenya as refugees. When we came to the camp, the camp was too dusty. People were not even seeing at each other at daytime. We were seeing bulldozers clearing up all the trees. There was no any tree that was left around. The food that we were given was not enough. We wanted milk, we need meat, clothing. So all those things were not there. So my, my dad now decided to convince my mother that he wants to go back to the farm and at least doing a lifeline support for the family. One of the ways in which we can look to, to try and solve refugee crises when we don't have the option of a return home is through resettlement. And there are a number of different ways that, that refugees kind of seek out resettlement. The kind of traditional one is, is, is humanitarian resettlement. It tends to be through UNHCR um, identifying you as someone in need of resettlement. And often that's about vulnerability. It's about maybe being um, an unaccompanied minor or being someone who's been a victim of, of torture or has particular medical needs. Another channel which is used is, is education. You know, many, many refugees seek scholarships and, and try and use those as a way of, of studying abroad and then hopefully translating that into some kind of post-study visas, post-study opportunity to stay. If you get it, it's like winning the lottery. Then you have a ticket to go to the States or to go to Europe or to go to Australia, um, and then those governments will help provide you with a new life in a new country. Um, but for the, everybody else, they're left waiting, hoping for some kind of resettlement that never arrives. The number of people who win resettlement every year to Europe or the States is around 2,000. The birth rate in the Dadaab camps is a thousand a month. So there's no way those numbers are ever going to match up. Um, and there's no way that the camp is ever going to go away unless people go back to Somalia in large numbers. Um, and the only way that that's going to happen is if there's peace in Somalia. So when he left, the first thing she told us our mother was, he has gone to fetch firewood and he will come back. I remember sometimes she will cook for us a good food to soothe us, to make us forget about him. The time now continued that we are missing our father. It's almost five years. There's a lady that come one day, she was dressed well and come in. They hug my mother and greet each other and they take tea together. And uh, we have seen that the, my mother was just crying and was saying what's not happening. That's when now the, the information came in that she was informed that my, my father now passed away. The idea of escaping the camp came to my mind when I heard about the, the death of my father. I always see passes coming, and there are people coming out from the past who are dressed well. I always ask them, oh, these guys, they are from where? 
They're from Nairobi, then there must be something good in Nairobi. And if I go, then I might be able to support my my family. I just decided to to do it by myself, not telling anyone, because I was afraid that if I share that information with my mother, and she will not allow me, and she will always take care of me and look me and follow me very closely. And I sneak one of the fine days to a pass and travel to Nairobi so that I can be able to be a lifeline and help uh, my family back here. The journey was not good. The police officers were off and into the pass we were traveling. I was always playing a cat and dog game, hiding uh, beneath the seats until we reached to Nairobi. I spent the night there, it was horrible. In the morning when I wake up, there's shower raining, people are rushing to work. I knew how to read and, and write, and I come across a hotel on that street and went to the cashier and asked him, hey, I'm here and I want a job. And uh, he said, yes, I will give you the job, but just have a seat and get breakfast. So that was welcoming. So I get the breakfast, I was happy, then I said, now, this is the time now you start your journey and your dream is becoming now through. You are not a curse to your family anymore and you can support them. Then all of a sudden now, when this old man came, gigantic, strong, bold, and said, who is this guy? Uh, I told him that I'm a refugee. I come from Dadaab. I'm with my family and I come here to support my family and I want a job. That's it. Then he told me, let's go. He took me back to the kitchen and he told me your work from today onward was to wash the utensils, clean and stay indoor. And if you try to leave the kitchen, then uh, you will face a trouble. We know you're a refugee, you are here illegally and you can't leave. We will not pay you anything, but we will give you what to eat and where to sleep. Don't try to talk to anyone in this hotel except me. And that's what I have been to for uh, like nine months. So I was not allowed to talk to anyone in, in the hotel. So I was washing utensils, staying indoor, and all of a sudden I heard my name. Is there anyone that knows you or maybe is another one that have a same namesake with you? And he had my, the name of my father. And he told me, yes, I know you. Can you come over? Then I came and we greet each other. Then I told him, we can't talk here. Then he said, let's go. We left, we sit somewhere, uh, talked. He asked me about my story, why I left, what happened. He gave me the story of uh, my family, my mother, and how they are feeling my absence. And uh, he told me now, uh, what should we do? Should we go back, accuse these people, get money, your rights? I said, no, no, we have to leave. I don't want to go back to that place anymore. Then we left, then in the next morning we drove off uh, a pass to uh, back to the dab. So when I came in, my parents, mother, brother didn't know that I'm coming. Then I, all of a sudden we knocked the door and when they saw me, it was just like, wow, they hugged me, why are you still alive? What happened, you know? My mother was also crying hard and said, why you did not share with me? before you left the camp. I said, I didn't want you to, uh, to stop me going out. And I told her that all I wanted was to support you, but it went the vice versa, the other way around. For a large number of refugees, they actually cannot volunteer repatriate to their home countries. They cannot locally integrate into their host countries. And so UN, uh, HCR, and the resettlement countries will work together to say, for a small number of individuals who cannot return home or locally integrate, we should consider resettlement for them, where they actually will be chosen and taken to a third country, where they can actually locally integrate into that host community. For many refugees, uh, the aspiration is to be resettled to a third country, but for most, it's an impossible dream. Uh, in Dadaab, uh, less than 1% of the population is resettled to a third country every year, and the process is very arcane and, and, and lengthy. What's happening in many places around the world is that when you're 
bordering a country that is, is experiencing significant war, those refugees are going to come across the border. And they are not screened, they are not selected. They basically go to a place where they're going to find safety. So in places in Africa and in Europe and other places, what you'll see is that there's a large number of refugees that are going into these countries and are screened um, after they get there, not screened beforehand. And so what's unique about the U.S. system is that we carefully select the refugees that we are going to resettle to the United States of America. Not only can a refugee not choose to come to the United States of America, but our system is really rigorous and it's pretty narrow. The pipeline is very backed up for the United States, for example. I think there are around 15,000 people who've been approved in Dadaab for resettlement. Um, but because the U.S. only takes around 1,000 a year, even if Dadaab closed tomorrow, it would still take 15 years for some of those people to get to the U.S. When I was away, my family got a resettlement opportunity, and the resettlement opportunities in the camp are given based on first come, first serve. I told them then way, how far they have gone with their process. They told me they are to meet the embassy after tomorrow. So it was like, whoa, gosh, do you want to leave me again? Uh, and I didn't see you for so long, and now that again you are also leaving me behind. They told me, no, uh, I will not let you uh, out. We have to go together and try your luck. We came to the compound. Our family name was called. We were allowed in. And when we sat now on the desk, the first question they were asked was, who is this guy? because the interviewer had already had their names and their photos. So mine was not there. So they said, this is what we have. Who is this person here? He's an intruder. And my mother said, no, he's my son. They said, no, he has to get off. Get out from here first, out. Then I went out. Then my mother was told that, go out. Switch decision of, uh, about your son, either. We'll take you back to the first interview, or he allows you out to continue your program and, and he joins you maybe later on. Then my mother said no, and then she came out. We consult. My brother also came. They said no. Let us insist that we go back and we start from the beginning so that you join us. I told them no, because I left alone to help you, and I know what I went through. Now, I don't want the same thing happen to you then because it is by luck you got your chance. This is the time you have to help each other and also help me out from this. I don't want you people to, to pass through the suffering that I went through again. Let me let you out, then I stay. You know, my mother was a bit reluctant about that, but she accepted because of my bleach and what I tell her and she didn't want to irritate me, so she accepted. That's how they want now, continue their process, and then I stay. With me, I didn't sleep the whole night. I knew that they would leave me, so I remember just coming and sitting next to my mother when she's sleeping, just looking at her, because that's what I wanted my eyes to take in, so that I have her in my mind all the time when she left. I wake them around 4.30, they wake up, they dress well, we leave with a taxi, they come to the UNHCR at the compound, three big buses that come there. Then they want, we wave, we hug, we cry. I wish them well and they left. For me, I was the second born of my mother. After I finished my education, I started course of journalism course, and then I started working for the family. And when Al-Shabaab arrived, Kismayo, they told me, you have to leave because you are journalism. We don't want to see a lady who is journalism because our religion is not allowed it. So that's why for me, I disappeared from there. Um, I came here in refugee camps. Since I came here, I start again and work with a radio station called Dadab FM there in Dadab. Then when I was working three months there, some of the people you told me, we don't want to hear women from our radio and our religion is not allowed it, so you leave the radio. So many times they call me, they call me, then I fear, then I leave work there. As we are Somali, we have a traditional culture. 
our fathers and our mothers, they say it, if the girl become the age of 15, she is supposed to marry instead of going to school. Most of them, they believe that. I say it, let us forget of uh, what we call culture and everything and bring the girls or ladies to the school. As a prophet of English says that, if you educate or teach a lady, you educate and national. But if you educate a boy, you only educate individually. Now I'm working as a journalism. I help my children, I help my family, everything. So I can say it, education is very important, especially for women. Girl child education is not that strong in, in, in the camps. Like a lot of parents keep their daughters at home. They're like uh, the, the breadwinners in the family. She goes and does child labor for the family. She works for another family and then earns like maybe a little wages at the end of the month. Because the mother is a single-headed household. She doesn't have anything to feed with nine kids at home. And you're having the eldest is a, a, a lady, second born girl, third born girl, fourth born. So the belief is that ladies, there's no need to take a girl to school because at the end of the day, she belongs to a man that you don't know. So why will you waste your money and educate a lady? She should better do some child labor and she supports you and do anything you want. There's absolutely a big gap between children who are in the camps and those who are out of the camp. And that is why we are here, to let them know that this is not a permanent position for them to stay forever. And we let them know that they can do better than anyone else out there. You have primary schools in the camp, you have secondary schools in the camp, but the competition to access those schools is very hot. So probably around 50%, 45% of kids are enrolled in primary school, and secondary school enrollment is less than that, is around 20%, 30 20%. Has a child that graduates primary school and wins a place at secondary school, they throw a massive party. They slaughter a goat or a camel, and the whole extended family comes to celebrate because that's a big deal. To win one of those slots at secondary school is a big deal. When people are coming uh, from Somalia to here, uh, almost 90% of the people are illiterate, and the schools were established in 1994. In three camps, they have established two, two schools. We have before three camps, Ifo Dagahle and Hagardera, and Ifo is one of the oldest camps. So we have uh, three to four schools in Ifo. In the French school, it's a school whereby we have uh, multinationals, like we have Gambelas, we have Somalis, we have Ethiopians, we have Burundis, we have Rwandas, we, we have Somali Bantus. We interact with them and then be friends with them. We try to make all those nationalities be uniform and then that will, will transform maybe where they came from, their, their homeland. I have the pleasure to call you to come in front and tell us exactly what you have written about your essay. Beginning about what Tom is all about, to the next about refugees and you conclude your work. Please welcome. Home is a place where we live in. At home, I usually fetch water for my cousin and make bricks for people to get some money so that I can buy books for reading. There is no security in this camp, and also there is no good medication. The life is very difficult. I face so many challenges. I am not comfortable with this life. Refugee means people who are displaced from their homeland due to civil war or insecurity. Children are very different. Some will tell you that they want to become a teacher. Others will tell you that they want to become a president. Others will tell you that, uh, that they want to marry because they think marriage is one of the successful things on this earth and get children. When I see the generation I was with and where I am now, education helped me a lot. The generations that are coming up now, the children, to get even higher than me, I want them to get that. So people have an ambition to go back to Somalia to boost the education in their country. They want to teach their children at home. And on the other hand, they want also to boost the economic scale of the country. Because once you become a learned person, 
you want to improve all factors which uh, affect the people in the, in the country. When I grow up, I want to become an engineer because I'm, you know, now I am expert in terms of mathematics. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a pilot. I want to be a doctor. I want to live somewhere abroad like USA. I would want to live in the United States of America. I want to live in America. When I first came here, I was young. I was about 11, 12 years old. When we came from Nairobi, like, I didn't know lots of English. When I came to Wilmer, um, I was very relieved because they're like, you know, people like me in Wilmer, like a lot of Somalians. When I started school, you know, I had a lot of help from people because since I was new to the country and I didn't know that much English, people were helping me. And one person who helped me a lot was Muhammad. My name is Muhammad Hassan. I am a cultural liaison here in Wilmer Senior High. I help newcomer students uh, when they get here, you know, to adjust with the school, with the system. Even some of the students who work, who come here, this is the first time they have ever been to school before. For them to go through, you know, the block from one pre period to another, being in a class is a new thing. We are an outstate rural community about 100 miles west of Minneapolis. We have an agricultural based economy. We had a migrant population of people from Mexico and Central America that came with the seasons, came with the growing seasons. And then about 10 years ago, another population began coming to the United States and ended up in Wilmer, and that is our naturalized refugees from the camps in, in Kenya with Somali background. All right, guys, today I'm going to take you to the Somali market. It's called um, Bean Shop, and the things they have here are a lot similar to the things that were back in Dab. And these are wonderful, you know, they're like kind of the same ones at the supermarket. They taste good. And this, finally, is called Anjera, and it's, man, one of the best ones you can get. When I first came to America, you know, I was very happy, but also I was surprised, you know, because it wasn't like what I thought it was. Everything was different. The weather was different, the atmosphere, the people, you know, everything was different. Obviously, UNHCR has the legal mandate to protect refugees, but in terms of service provision and actual operational presence in the camp, they tend to operate with a number of other agencies in partnership. Um, and that can vary from region to region, can even vary sometimes from camp to camp within a country. But, you know, the, the agencies you often see are the World Food Programme, dealing with food distribution, Oxfam, who are often involved particularly in water and sanitation issues, names like Care, Save the Children, IOM, you UNICEF. The best way to think about how the agencies in UNHCR operate is, you know, it's specialization of labor and it's about institutional capacity and expertise. And many of these agencies, um, you know, have a particular expertise in dealing with one aspect of a humanitarian emergency. WFP, we are the food arm of the United Nations. Our main mandate is to provide food assistance. It's a quite huge undertaking because uh, almost half a million uh, beneficiaries, uh, to, to manage those ones is not easy and uh, it takes a lot of effort. Currently, uh, 406,000 refugees which are being assisted and that means that we are bringing in approximately 8,000 tons of food every every month. The tracking of the refugees is very difficult. Despite sophisticated systems by UNHCR in place, you can uh, not always track the refugees going back to the country, moving to another place, leaving somebody behind with their ration cards or with their entitlement papers. So one form of targeting is a fingerprint check which we are implementing now in uh, the DAP. This allows us to compare the fingerprints to the database. 
The ones who come and their fingerprints do not match, they will not be served any food. So that's what we call no match, no food. So that's one of the approaches to get the resources, the limited resources, to the genuine and uh, vulnerable and right beneficiaries. The refugees are not allowed to work. And what that means is that the UN has the responsibility for keeping them alive. The way that it does that is it distributes food every two weeks. So every 15 days, if you're a refugee, if I'm a refugee, I have a ration card with uh, the days of the week and all of the dates that I'm supposed to get my food. I go to the food warehouse and I have it punched. And then there's, it looks like an airport. There's nine big warehouses with different foodstuffs in them. And you go into each warehouse and you collect um, maybe uh, a kilo of rice or two kilos of sorghum or maize or beans and then you get a bit of oil a little bit of salt um, and that's it that's what you're supposed to survive on what it doesn't give you is any kind of tea or sugar or meat or vegetables so what people do is they take their dry rations it's called and they go to the market and they sell half or 10 percent in order to buy things that they're not given like the small luxuries like tea and sugar um, or if you want a pair of shoes or if you want some underwear um, you've got to sell your rations in order to buy those things so the price of anything any little luxury in the camp is hunger certainly as a refugee crisis gets older the kind of needs of the population change from being ones where it's very obvious what the humanitarian community should do, which is about keeping people alive. It's about giving people food aid and blankets and basic shelter, to how do you start, in effect, building people's lives up. And that's where the relationship with the state, the relationship with you know, the refugee community um, start to become much more important, but often also much more problematic. This camp is a bit different from the other camps because uh, we have refugees kind of uh, confined in one place over a long period of time. Kenyan government has an encampment policy where the refugees are supposed to stay within the camp. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a challenge when you compare to other camps. So we find that the refugees cannot access other opportunities outside the camp. So most of the agencies that are working within this camp, for example, are forced to actually give assistance 100%. So the refugees are dependent on the agency almost 100% because they have no any other source of livelihood. Well, the idea of keeping people in camps is to keep them separate from the population. So what Kenya wants to avoid is lots of Somalis coming into Nairobi, um, increasing the population of Somalis in Nairobi and taking jobs from Kenyans. So a big part of the rhetoric uh, around refugees, not just in Kenya but in many other countries, is that we don't want them coming and taking our jobs. The fact that refugees actually are economic actors who usually contribute a lot to economies is often disregarded by governments. And then the responsibility for looking after them falls on the UN. So the way that they stay alive is by being fed from the UN, not working. So the UN is obliged to simply feed people um, and not provide them with jobs, not keep themselves sufficient. It runs against all kinds of common sense, but this is the politics that underlines the policy of encampment. It was 2010. The good news came when I was first posted for my first interview for the settlement process to USA. The best moment of my life. I was very happy that I say, this is the time now you get now your dream to go, to join your family back. The next morning I came, I was interviewed, uh, and the basic things they ask you is about your, your name, your life, in the camp, how long you have been here, your card number, and all that. Then I waited for the next interview. Are you looking forward to going uh, on resettlement soon? Yes, I'm very hopeful. Okay. I'm very hopeful to... And how long have you been here in the dock? November 1991, we arrived at the dock. My name is Eric. I'm a resettlement officer here in the dock. We're working with selection missions, the US, Canada, the Netherlands, the UK, the Scandinavian countries, in order to bring the people from here to there so they can restart their lives. Then on February 2011, 
the first part of our family was taken to U.S. Okay, which March. state? Uh, in the first place, they were taken to the state of Oregon. Currently, there's probably 16,000 people in the pipeline, either waiting at various interviews, not with us, with other actors in the resettlement process, or waiting departure, but they've been delayed for different reasons. And so there's this sense of abandonment among the refugees. There's a sense of frustration among the refugees. This particular case is sort of a classic case of someone who submitted, let's say, five years ago. His mother has departed, his brothers have departed, everyone has departed. They're in a better place, the kids are in school, and so he was stuck behind here. So it's just you who's now waiting to, to depart. Yeah, I'm waiting to depart. Okay. Inshallah, as soon as the chance is available. Yeah, hopefully that will be soon. Inshallah. And in the next few interview, again, it came after uh, two weeks. I was called again. I came with my certificates. Uh, I write the whole story of my life from Somalia to Kenya, to the Dab, how we apart my family, what happened, the whole process. Then I was told, sign, and from now onward, wait for the embassy. Two Spanish aid workers have been kidnapped by gunmen in Kenya's Dadaab refugee camp. The driver of the vehicle was shot and left for dead as the gunman drove away into Somalia with two Spanish women. The fate of two Spanish women working for the Médecins Sans Frontières aid agency is unknown. The incidents has sparked a stern response from the government. So we consider it as a provocation by the Al-Shabaab to the Kenyan's sovereignty. This is the third abduction of Westerners in Kenya by attackers linked to Somalia in one month. Immediately, of course, all of the aid agencies were very nervous about their own staff. So there was a mass withdrawal from the camps. The UN suspended um, all services except what it called life-saving services. And the refugees had to step up and provide things for themselves. So they had to uh, go and collect all the diesel for the boreholes, they had to do the food distribution, they had to work as the nurses in the clinics, they had to uh, patrol their own camp, they had to collect their own refuse. So the, the, the agencies pretty much just disappeared. Immediately after the news came out that uh, these two medical staff were kidnapped, it had an impact on me specifically, that I will not get a chance to go for my interview because the embassy staff that wanted to interview me will not be here. They suspend immediately the interview and left for Nairobi. So it's like security, security, security is always an obstacle to me. The kidnapping or insecurity, it sort of puts it all to a halt. Countries don't want submissions anymore. They don't want to process anymore. It's not that they cancel the cases. They're just sort of put on hold, which contributes to frustration in refugees, contributes to our frustration because we can't move the cases. So it can be, um, it can be a bit aggravating, for lack of better words. From that time up to now, I'm still waiting, waiting and waiting. All I could do was email the embassy with my documents and ask them what happened to my case because my case was taking too long now, almost two years. They answered to me the email and told me that your case is active, we receive your ID card and you have to wait and be patient and you will be part of the first slot that uh, we are going to start to interview them. So it is always very difficult. It's just uh, all I have to do is wait, be patient, and it all depends on the grace of God. But what I'm sure for is one day it will come to join my family back. So the resettlement process can take decades. There are some people in the camp who are, have been waiting for 15 years to go to the United States. When the UN actually goes through its registration and figures out which refugees cannot return home or locally integrate, at that point they will refer these refugees to the United States. 
Now, once the United States receives information from the UN and establishes uh, the criteria for refugees to come into the United States, at that point, they'll collect all the data from the UN. Every refugee gets paired with a Department of Homeland Security official in which they have a face-to-face -face interview. When they are actually verified in terms of their identity and their persecution claim and consistency in their story, will they then get referred through all the various security agencies that need to check this case. Once a refugee passes all of its uh, security screenings as well as medical screenings, which is a part of the process, they'll actually get referred to a resettlement agency like World Relief. And normally it takes about a year and a half to two years for an entire refugee case to be processed, which is a pretty lengthy period of time. And that's because there's so many aspects to that processing, which is collecting the data and doing the security screenings. So there's this endless process of waiting and continually all of your hopes and dreams are dependent on this very drawn out process. We are in Hagadera Studio, meted for Star Media Development Center. This is uh, supported by Internews Europe. Internews Europe is an international media development organization. For the last nine months, we've trained 20 youth from the hosting community and the refugees in Gadaab. Dirk is one of the refugee youth from Hagadera. Uh, he's been a reporter and a technical person in Mogadishu. He's now uh, the one responsible and manning the technical aspect here in our Hagadera studio. Mohamed Baroud is uh, one of the refugees, also he's from E4 refugee camp. Fartoun Abdigedi is the co-presenter and the only female presenter that we at this particular moment have who goes on air Monday to Friday every month for the last nine months. She has not had any journalistic experience and uh, today, as you can see, she is one of the, our proud presenters. The project is meant to give the youth technical skills and at the same time, it is an opportunity for the refugees to hear their voices. At Internews, we say information saves lives. So this project, we regard, has changed the lives and it's becoming a household name. This studio is meant to voice the concerns of the voices in the refugee camps. Now here we have the WFM radio. Mostly for those who are listening, they know more about the news, the world, what is going on, what is important and what is not important. But if you don't listen, if you don't get a news, that means you are sleeping, you are not waking up. I want to come here today to ask you what the Refugee United is and how Refugee United is working, in which way they help the people who are missing their family. So I want to ask so many questions about that. For whoever is in need mm -hmm. of our uh, service, mm -hmm. um, in particular in Dadaab, they there is a team in each camp. So an IFO, Dagahale, Agadera, and IFO too. And they will be assisting the beneficiaries uh, in their houses or in during community forums. Your name? Lovely. Well, I mean, and you just explain for us how did you receive your or your miss, missing family and the way that you have, the process that you have passed before. I found my sister through Nyankor, because okay. she's my friend. She told me that she was working with the RU. So I asked her, what is the meaning of RU? She told me this RU is from Red Cross. I told her, and what is the work of Red Cross? They said that this office of Red Cross, they, they do connect people with their missing loved one. So I told her that I have two sisters whom are missing. Can you help me search for them? So where does she like live now? She lives in Kakuma. So you have all that because you, you get your sister or your family, you have missed almost uh, ten, 10 years. So now how do you feel about that now? I'm happy, of course. You're happy? Yeah. Okay. What are you going to tell the others who are doesn't know and who are not aware now? What are you going to advise them? What I can only say to them is that if you want to search for your sister, then come to this office of are you, you will get your missing family. Really, I'm very happy since I'm connecting for the society that I'm living with them as well as Refugee United. Asha? When uh, new arrivals, uh, refugees come to uh, the camp, it's very uh, difficult for the community to understand better, like they don't understand the language. Maybe the community leaders are not very active because the community leaders are the 
bridge between the community and the agencies that are working around. So someone that have stayed here for so long, like me, who had been here for 20 years and understands really the situation, uh, might regularly or at times come and, you know, talk to different communities new to the camp and, you know, give them uh, a sort of proper understanding and the proper channels in which they will use to get really what they want. They have right to get water, they have right to get health, they have right to get medication, they have right to get free education and, you know, security and all that they need, then they have to talk to the community leaders. And community leaders are uh, both female and male. They are the overall chairman and the chair lady. We have the section leaders, we have the block leaders, and all they are elected. The bridge between the community and the agencies People like us, the youths, are overtaking for the leadership uh, so that the community are not taken for granted. So this is what I regularly do at times to you know, give my own time to support them. Are, are not rich people. Refugees are, are the one who doesn't have people, so they come here. When I was in Nairobi, our house, our house got burnt. Thieves came and burnt it. So my mother heard about this camera and we came here, so we'll, we will have protection here. We are going in to the block called S3, where I live. This is the block of Sudanese. But in this block, we are only Sudanese and, and we love each other. Everybody is uh, our friends here. It's our block. When we came here, we went to transit first. Then my mother was sick. Then she went to, to Nairobi and went to the hospital. And us, we came to live here together with my aunt. What makes you sad about here? My mother is not here. When communities are healthy, when they're not going to the hospital, they can be engaged into other meaningful livelihood activities. They can be productive. As they say, a sick society is an unproductive society and very vulnerable. Washes, water sanitation and hygiene promotion. Entirely our project is all about water supply, water quality, sanitation and hygiene, which impacts generally on the health of the beneficiaries. So basically that is uh, the main goal of the WASH program in uh, the DAB. Food they give you here and water, you have it for free. It's not like in Nairobi where you fetch water. At the end of the day, these people are living in the camps here where the water, the latrines, the hygiene promotion, where they're going back. Are there those systems in place? Because if they're not in place, they'll keep on trickling in and back and bringing disease, which will in turn affect where they've come from. I know their plans are in place by the Kenyan government to move the refugees to Somali. It has taken us a long time to build these structures in the dub over 20 years. And we want them to go back there where infrastructures have been broken. So it needs time, time and time again. Change does not come within a day. Yeah. One day I just came across port busted by an agency that works around here called Film Aid that they want to train youth on filmmaking in a project called Participatory Video Project. We were told to write stories. And we didn't know how to write stories. What we know was maybe writing compositions, but this one is a bit diff different from the composition because in filmmaking, all that you write should be something uh, that is um, visual. Today, I just decided to share with you uh, a script that I was uh, working on. It is what I went through in my life when I decided to escape from the camp and uh, 
uh, I went through a hardship. So I just decided to be a voice to the rest of the uh, community members, specifically the youths, not to uh, follow the, the same procedure. I will just f uh, first share with you the uh, rough schedule and also the synopsis. And uh, my main character is Ali. And uh, this is how the synopsis is. Ali is a young man who faces the enormity of unemployment in the camp, who decides to pursue better opportunity outside the camp. He goes to jail and faces trial and is deported back to the camp. He joined a friendship by an agency and turns to be a successful skill boy. This is briefly what this story is all about. And uh, uh, I want to get your input and, you know, uh, how best you think we can come up uh, this script? How old is Ali? Uh, I, Ali uh, will be at the age of either 25 or 24, 26. But mostly the age that lives in the high school here is around 20, 21 there. Also address the issue of the family. You know, because if you live here illegally, I don't think the repercussions are only to you. Yeah. There's still repercussions to the family, you know, but from the synopsis, for me, I think the story is good and very encouraging. Okay. It will help a lot of the youth Thank in you. this community here. Thank you. You know, I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. So for me, just go ahead and just write the script. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. I remember writing uh, 25 stories, 25 stories, and I was told all these 25 cannot be done. It was difficult. And, uh, Lastly, I come up with one story. That story was the story about uh, drug, the cut, and it was the first story that I directed. We didn't know that this is what film all about. We didn't know that in film you can change a community, you can lead a community in a good shape. Lastly, I was allowed to be a facilitator, to work and support the other youths to facilitate and teach them more about filmmaking, of which I always like it. And uh, uh, I, there are some youths that I train in filmmaking who knows better than me now how to write strips, how to write stories, and how to direct films. And I appreciate that. Ivan was a very social person. He was very eager to teach us well and uh, just instill us that knowledge he has about journalism and video making. So whenever there is a problem, he comes and helps me. Whenever there is something that I don't understand about filmmaking, he is the person that I ask. He is always my closest friend. Tomorrow I am going to Australia. I think I will be very nervous because it is my first time to board a flight and a plane and uh, living a place that you have been living for the last 21 years is, uh, you know, very emotional. I'll be also leaving my friend and some of my family's back and uh, I'm, uh, I'm happy, as I said, to go to Australia but very emotional because I'm leaving back my friends. And uh, you're going to a new place, so you don't know what will happen to that new place. Tell me. I'm okay. So, uh, how's your feeling now that you are leaving us? I'm very happy. I'm very happy. I'm also uh, not happy. Why? Because I am leaving my <laughs> friend this year back. <laughs> and I'm happy because I'm going to another developed country. So, I want to see how life is there. Well, uh, for me, I'm still uh, waiting. Mm. Uh, my uh, JVA mm -hmm. interview. Okay. And uh, I think mine will take much time. Uh, we will miss you much. Uh, I, will, I will miss you also. I will miss you also. And I hope you also come there soon. Okay. And your case will be finished soon. So if you go to Australia, will you continue uh, doing filmmaking, uh, be part in the uh, you know, doing your art industry or? Absolutely. I want to become a great journalist. Then in Australia, then come to my home country, Somalia. Okay. Then 
they are well known, a prominent journalist. So if I come to America, uh, I will look for you uh, in Australia. Our connection will not be lost. Okay. I'll be there for you every okay, time. wish you the yeah. best. Thank I you think, so much. Uh, we'll miss you much. I will miss but you also. I will also have, I think, uh, yeah. farm today, eat something. Yeah, food. What did you prepare for us? I have prepared meat, okay. pasta, <laughs> rice. So we'll eat a lot. Okay. <laughs> Welcome. And have fun. Uh, we'll okay. have fun. Do you remember the day I hit you, uh, your finger, uh, with the car when you were lying? <laughs> I remember. Do you know that? Yes. That day. <laughs> My hand was almost wounded for three weeks. Okay. Uh, what, what, what will you miss? Because the dab was your, like your home. home yeah. You came here when you were very young. So. so. The greatest thing I'll miss is because of my friends, the other thing. Uh -huh. I'll miss my friends. Work I have mates. Work mates, school mates, school mates, all this my friends. I think I have to make new friends when I go there. Don't go where you don't know. Mm. And, uh, you know, they are, they are very built up roads around, so many vehicles take care. Otherwise, they will smash you. <laughs> 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 yeah, the highway, super highway. So. Okay. I think uh, you will meet me tomorrow in the bus. Yeah, so for sure. You will be coming to me. And if you can come tonight, you can come to house and uh, together we can go to the bus like that. Uh -huh. Waiting is very emotional itself. You wait for a long time, long time, and then things do not come very easily. I hope, first of all, Lebanon's case to progress faster. <laughs> But uh, I will advise him to be patient, and one day he will also live. Liban, like when we talk, he told me that education is the key. Like education is the most important thing in life. If you want to succeed, you gotta be, you know, doing like you gotta have education. If you want to find a good job, it will get you to where you want in life. And he always told me that to always stick with education. I believe that if I work very, very hard, I will succeed in life. And I worked very, very hard in school. Graduation means freedom to me. <laughs> but of course, I want to make the best decision for me and for my family. And I want to work and I want to also go to college at the same time. The Kenyan government often talks about closing Dadaab. Reformor means the forcible return of refugees back to the war zone that they came from. Um, and this is illegal under international law because refugees have come seeking safety. You're supposed to provide them with safety, with sanctuary. Kenya uh, doesn't want the refugees to make a home in Kenya. Whenever there's been terrorist attacks on Kenyan soil, the government's been very quick to blame the refugees and to try and use that as a pretext to push them back home again. I think the realistic options are either that Kenya tries to forcefully close the camp and bulldoze it and push people back to Somalia, which would be a humanitarian disaster, would be illegal, and would be an absolute tragedy for everybody. You have three generations who've grown up in this camp. It's home, it's a city where they've invested money, they've built businesses, they've buried their relatives in the sand there, they cut their knees when they were kids on the soil there, so they feel love for that place, even though it's a miserable place, it's home. Another lesson of Dadaab is that this is the world's biggest refugee camp, but it's by no means the only one. Many of them are living in camps in Ethiopia, in Sudan, in Pakistan, in Jordan, in 
Lebanon and so on, Turkey. And as long as these wars continue, um, where people can't go home, and as long as um, the rich world doesn't want these refugees, it's going to become a convenient option to warehouse them, to stick them in these camps. We're going to see more and more of these cities springing up, these, these cities full of stateless people in limbo. It's going to become a feature of the 21st century. Within my lifetime, big parts of the Sahel region of Africa are going to become uninhabitable, and those people are going to move. We're going to see big population movements within North America, within Europe, as people flee parts of the planet that are unsustainable. So we're going to need to get used to people moving, to treating them as humans, and to looking after them in a way that we would like to be looked after. It's very difficult as someone who looks at this from a kind of global perspective to see you know, a lot of hope in terms of solutions and in terms of resolution. And, you know, often it's it's about getting, you know, really angry and trying not to get too despondent um, when you look at it and instead trying to channel that energy towards, you know, persuading governments and persuading organizations to, to keep lobbying for, for more resettlement places, for a greater investment in development, for, um, you know, encouraging governments like Kenya to stop putting, you know, that level of restriction upon people and, and to start offering paths for at least people who are, you know, third generation refugees to, to actually get out of the camps and live a legal life. But it is a very hard argument to make because most governments don't want to listen at the moment. The whole word of refugee has, has ended up having negative connotations, um, which is kind of crazy because actually all of the economic statistics show that refugees are net contributors to economic growth, to the domestic prosperity of, of a country. Um, and we really need to start seeing these people as, as economic actors, as fully fledged humans with all of the rights and, um, and, and obligations and problems that we have. It, it's kind of crazy that, that we need to be reminded of this, that they are human. Um, and the way to do that is through looking at individuals, is to see people as three-dimensional human beings, to uh, empathize with all of their, their problems, their triumphs, their tragedies, um, to fall in love with them a little bit, to identify with them, to see the world through their eyes and then hopefully you begin to, to see what it might be like um, if you were in their shoes. It's been eight and a half years since I saw the band. I was you know, a little kid and now I'm a man now. I always dreamt about like Levine coming to the United States one day and you know wrestling with us. He's a big part of our family. Everybody in the family will go wild and start hugging him because you know we just haven't seen him like in so long. There will be tears of joy when I see him. I mean, I I, I don't cry a lot, but this time it'll be you know like te there will be tears. This is going to be like a new adventure. Because when we were young, we were always just sort of like hanging out with him, you know, teaching me life lessons and all that stuff. And now I'll be the one teaching him some lessons about the United States. It's going to be different. It was uh, an emotional moment to, to meet your family that we were apart for nine years. But I managed to meet my mother, my sister, my brother, Talim and it was emotional to see him for the first time. He, he was a younger brother of mine. He didn't know anything. He was just in the school, in the elementary when he left the dab. He was born in the dab, but he was just very strong. If my father was alive today, like, he'll be even you know, happier than my mom, I'd say, because the band's like a role to all of us. It's crazy for me to go ahead and walking besides my brother, who I haven't seen him in like eight and a half years. Well, the word refugee is, is, is not a good thing. If you are a refugee, there are so many rights that you will not get. Imagine someone is restricted in 25 years in one camp, and you are not allowed to leave the camp. You are mistreated, you are overlooked, 
you are looked down when you are a refugee. In my mind, it's a, the Dab is a place that I will never forget in my life. It is in my heart, and I will never forget. I love the people of the Dab. I love the Dab too much, but I have to leave because it is always painful to stay as a refugee in a quarter century. A home means to me a lot. When I come to the United States of America, I feel that I'm at home. I feel that I'm with my family. I feel that I will be given all the rights that I need. I will work, I will have you know, bank account, I will help other people, I will be a taxpayer. So there's so many things that is coming. Uh, and uh, the future is bright. And I feel that in the United States of America will be my home and will be ever. Uh, my first plan in the United States of America is to, first of all, look for a job because that's the major important thing because it's not like anymore in the DAB where you get free for everything. Here in the United States, you have to fight for yourself. You have to get housing, you have to get electricity, you have to get water, you have to get a car, you have to get everything. So the major important thing for me is job. If there is film schools within Wilmer, I'm ready for it and I will join to pursue my experience in making films to show the rest of the world that Somalis in America or other refugees in America found a new home, have hopes, and are ready to be part of the global world. My name is uh, Liban Mohammed. I am 29 years old. I was born in 1987. I was born in Somalia. I fled from Somalia because of the civil war and I come to the Dab refugee camps in Kenya. I have been living there for 25 years. I belong to a family that torn apart. I managed to reunite with them, and I'm here in the United States of America. I expect uh, a good life together. <laughs>